25 years ago, our clinical and theoretical understanding of pain took a giant step forward with Melzack and Wall's gate control theory of pain, published in their book, The Puzzle of Pain. For the first time, there was an explanation of why pain varied between patients with the same kind of painful condition and why pain sensation was influenced by psychological factors like anxiety or confidence. How did they develop this theory? Dr. Melzack. Well, you have to keep in mind that, there, that for centuries we've had the same ideas about pain. And these are summarized by Descartes' little man whose foot is in the flame. And Descartes' view of pain was that when you have an injury, uh, that is like you're pulling the, the rope in a bell tower. You're pulling the rope at the bottom of the bell tower, the bell goes off at the top and alerts everybody that, that there's a fire. So what you conclude from that is that you have pain only when there is injury. You also conclude that the amount of pain you feel is proportional to the extent of the, of the injury. Now, those concepts have prevailed over the, over the centuries. And the, the physiologists at the turn of the century espoused that idea because it seems so logical that there should be pain fibers. I mean, obviously, we've got uh, an optic nerve for seeing and an auditory nerve for hearing. Uh, there are nerves coming from the body. And so it was a man called von Frey who extended this idea of there being a, being a specific pain system and said, uh, that there are pain fibers, and he said that, that there are receptors for pain in the skin. There are also receptors for warmth, for cold, and for touch. Well, those were, the, those were the, the modalities. Well, the search was on then to find pain fibers, and people soon honed in or honed in on the, on the small myelinated fibers and the C fibers. So if you record from a nerve, it, the nerve obviously is made up of fibers of different sizes, and it was decided that the very large fibers were uh, touch fibers. Uh, the very largest ones were related to muscle sense and so forth, proprioception. But the small fibers were the ones that carried temperature and pain. So you have your A delta fibers, those are the small myelinated fibers, and the C fibers, which are unmyelinated. Those are the pain fibers. Then it was decided that a pathway in the spinal cord called the spinothalamic tract is the pain pathway. And then there was some debate about where in the brain is the center for pain, and Sir Henry Head said it's in the thalamus, uh, because people with lesions in certain parts of the, of the thalamus do have pain. And uh, so uh, that really was the picture of a straight-through pathway. And again, very important to recognize that implicit in that story is the idea that when you have got pain, it means you've got an injury. If you have an injury, you're going to have pain, and the amount of pain you feel is proportional to the size of the injury. Well, all that we began to learn in the 1940s and 50s is, is wrong. It's not entirely wrong. It's wrong to the extent that uh, people came to recognize that you can have pain with no injury. So uh, here now we're very thoughtful physicians of various kinds, neurosurgeons uh, especially, and neurologists, who said, look, here is somebody with low back pain. They're crippled with low back pain, and I cannot find anything. I've taken x-rays. I've done, given this person the best physical examination I can. I find nothing. Then you had work, uh, in contrast, you had work done by people like Harry Beecher, who was a superbly observant uh, anesthesiologist, who said, look, two out of three men severely wounded in battle do not feel any pain. And if you offer them morphine for their pain, they tell you, I don't want any morphine because I am not in pain. So obviously, the system is just a heck of a lot more complicated than injury being pain. So it's very important to realize that you've got sensory fibers that come into the spinal cord. And then there are cell bodies in the dorsal horns of the spinal cord that send their messages through fibers that cross, go across the cord and go up to the brain. Those fibers, in part, comprise what is known as the spinothalamic tract. But uh, there's, there's a lot more that is sending, a lot more, in the, a lot more fibers in the spinal cord uh, that send uh, information or messages about pain up to the brain. In, in any case, what Pat Wall was looking at was an area between these incoming fibers and the cell bodies and their dendrites that receive these messages 
that go to the brain. And in between is an area, is an area called the substantia gelatinosa. So Pat and I proposed then that the messages that come in from the body must somehow trickle through the substantia gelatinosa, and the substantia gelatinosa acts like a gate. So these messages coming in from the sensory fibers either activate these cells that send the messages to the brain, or they may not activate them. The, bait, the uh, gate can be open all the way, or it can be shut. So, for example, the men at the battlefront, their gates there are shut. One can argue that these men are in a state of shock because they've been wounded. It's just not so. I mean, Beecher showed, in fact, that these men who said that this terrible wound in my leg doesn't hurt me, uh, he, he showed that these men will react to a vein puncture by screaming and yelling, saying, that hurts horribly. <laughs> Obviously, they are not in shock. What the gate theory then says is that we've got a variable gate that can be wide open or closed or anywhere in between. And it was Pat Wall's lovely physiological studies that, that suggested that large fibers tend to close a gate, large fiber activity. So when you are injured, in fact, one of the first things you do is you, be, is you rub the area, gently, very gently. Uh, if, you've got a, if, you, if you have an itch, you scratch it very gently because you've learned that if you scratch harder, you increase the itch or you produce pain. So when you activate skin, when you touch skin, rub skin gently, you activate large fibers. The more you squeeze it, the harder the pressure, the more you activate the small fibers. So we propose then that activating large fibers tends to close the gate, activating the small fibers opens the gate, and proposed a specific mechanism, very hypothetical, a, a, a mechanism by which the substantia gelatinosa does this. Now when we say the gate is open, what we really mean is that the substantia gelatinosa is facilitating the flow of information up to the brain. When we say the gate's closed, we mean that the substantia gelatinosa inhibits the transmission of information from afferent fibers to the cells that send the messages up to the brain. Now, I also had to put in there, obviously, a major descending connection from the brain that can open or close the gate. That was purely speculative, but I knew darn well it absolutely had to be the case. Now, I had done research years before, some, some years before, in which I found that an area in the brain stem, right in the middle of the brain stem, roughly about the area between the ears, that this area exerts a continuous inhibitory control over pain. Okay? This is in the reticular formation, and it's called the periaqueductal gray, and the, and the central tegmental tract that surrounds it, just around that area. It was discovered that by closing, by stimulating this area, you close the gate, but if you give naloxone, which is a morphine inhibitor, you somehow influence the effect, you, you prevent the pain decreasing effects of stimulating this area. So somehow, there's morphine involved in this. Then it was discovered quite independently by two different groups, one in Germany, and one in Japan, that if you squirt tiny amounts of morphine into that area between the ears, that periaqueductal peri gray area, that you also decrease the perception of pain. Then the question is, why on earth would there be receptors for morphine? So Kosterlitz and one of his students, uh, um, Hughes decided to look for morphine-like substances, and they found them. So people began to find receptors, uh, say, molecules on cell bodies that receive the morphine molecule. They found that the brain, as well as many other tissues in the body, produce uh, uh, morphine-like substances, which we now know as endorphins and encephalins and dynorphins and so forth. All right? So that was this great discovery. Well, now what you've got is a gate which can be influenced by what's coming in from the body. You've got a gate that is influenced by what's coming down from the brain, coming down from the cortex, as well as from this controlling system. Uh, you've also got a way of explaining acupuncture, because when you put a needle in an acupuncture area, a, prop, a, a proper area, you stick it in and twirl it to produce pain. When you, when you use acupuncture for pain, you twirl the needle to produce pain. And that would activate that mechanism in the brain stem that would then send messages to close the gate to in, 
to injury-produced impulses coming from other areas. Then it was discovered that cells from the viscera, that nerve fibers coming from the viscera, impinge on those cells in the spinal cord uh, that, that send messages from injury on the surface of the body. So now you have a mechanism for referred pain. Somebody has a heart attack, they tend very often to feel pain in the shoulder and the, and the arm, not in the viscera, right? And so all of these stories, all these, this, all these bits and pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. <clears throat> Before the gate control theory, there was no real place for the psychologist. The only way you could try to abolish pain was to, cut, was to try to cut that wire. And those people were so, were so ingrained that there was a, a wire, a system going from the body to the brain, that they thought the only what you do is, if you, want to, if you want the telephone to stop ringing, you pull it out of the wall, right? You cut the wire. Yeah. Pat Wall, on the basis of his physiology, decided that it should be possible to close the gate by selectively activating large fibers. And so he and William Sweet, who's a neurosurgeon in Boston, did this with patients with pain. And they simply just put little electrodes on the skin, or sometimes they put electrodes around the nerve. But in any case, they gently stimulated the area of the skin or the nerve, activated large fibers, and indeed it decreased pain. And the whole field of transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation was born. Now, hypnosis is another example of a, a procedure that can effectively help some people with pain problems. It doesn't work for everybody by any means. But what's involved in hypnosis is relaxation, strong suggestion, which we know is tremendously important uh, so that the brain can come down and affect the gait, um, and at the same time, relaxation. All of these things are, uh, can contribute to the, the relief of pain. So I'll end off by saying that I very often use as, a, as an analogy or as a way of thinking about pain, of thinking about the cells that send abnormal messages to the brain as being like the hub of a wheel with multiple spokes that feed into that hub. So if you imagine here is the hub, here are the fibers that send messages up to the brain, and here are these spokes. And you have one spoke, let's say it is, would obviously be um, fibers from the area that is injured. But there's another spoke that might be input of a very low level from an area that had been injured and where you might have small muscles in chronic contraction or spasm that are sending an input that by themselves don't normally give rise to pain, but with this injury, suddenly they begin to hurt. You've got input from the viscera. You've got changes due to sympathetic nervous system activity. You've got a downflow from the brain that consists of your present worries uh, and fears. You've got another downflow from the brain that is produced by your culture and your past experience and everything you have learned about the meaning of the situation. And so, obviously, if you've got all of these multiple contributions to pain, then what we should do is use several together in the attempt to block pain. So you can have the use of a transcutaneous stimulator, for example, to help close the gate. At the same time, you can try to decrease anxiety using psychological procedures. You can use suggestion and the placebo effect, which can be effective in closing the gate. Uh, you can use antidepressant drugs, which we know have a pain-relieving effect in addition to decreasing depression. Uh, depression. So uh, all of these techniques can be used at the same time to help people who are in pain, and they're being used increasingly effectively.